Namaste and good evening, everyone. I, Ritika Gupta, Assistant Director at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evam Niti Anusandhan Sansthan, Nay Delhi, welcome you to IMPRI hashtag web policy talk. Today, we have gathered here for a special talk on thinking ecologically about development in India cities by Professor Harini Nagendra. I would like to welcome our moderator for today, Dr. Somyadeep Chattopadhyay, who is joining us from Kolkata. He is Associate Professor at Vishwa Bharati University, Shanti Niketan, West Bengal, and Senior Fellow at IMPRI. Sir, the floor is, floor is yours now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ritika, and very uh, good evening to all of you, uh, Professor Harini, and also all the panelists. Uh, just to set the context a bit, uh, uh, just uh, as we know that India has uh, urbanized rapidly in recent years, but uh, poorly managed urban growth and development has exacerbated inequalities, exclusion, vulnerabilities, especially among the marginalized population. And the sustainability issues are uh, also becoming more and more important in determining the quality of life of the urban residents, uh, the economic productivity of Indian cities, uh, and, and the state of the national environment. And there is a range of developmental uh, choices uh, that will shape their growth and a long-term economic, social, and uh, environmental sustainability. Uh, policymakers often cite the need to modernize the cities, but uh, that at the come at the cost of environmental degradation. We expect that our, once the cities become uh, more developed, uh, the rate of pollution and environmental dest destructions will decrease and eventually recede. So essentially, uh, the choices that we are have uh, having are, are complex. We, with different, differing short-term versus long-term cost and benefits. And also in India, uh, these choices are seldom determined by individuals, actors, or agencies, but are shaped by a complex uh, decision-making processes involving several actors across the national and local governments. There are investors or entrepreneurs in the private sectors, and also a range of local community and, and civil society voices. So, so it, therefore, it is important to understand what actually constitutes sustainability and how it should be pursued as a policy goal. Are the urban development plan and policies in India the best way to go about it? And how far they will contribute to the overall urban sustainability? Can we think of our cities in a bit different way? So today we are delighted to have uh, uh, among us Professor Harini Nagendra, uh, who is the director of the Azim Premji University Research Center. And also she leads the University Center for Climate change and sustainability and she's a well-known public speaker and writer on uh, issues of urban sustainability in India. In fact over the past 25 years uh, she has been at the leading age of research examining uh, the converse conservation in forests and cities of South Asia uh, from the perspective of both landscape ecology and social justice. And for our interdisciplinary research and practice, uh, uh, Professor Harini has received a number of awards, including 2009 Kozareli Prize from the US National Academy of Sciences, uh, the 2013 Eleanor Ostrom Senior Scholar Award, and the 2017 Claire Witt Wave of Science Award. And her publication uh, include the books, uh, The Nature in the City, uh, Bengaluru in the Past, Present and Future, published by OUP and the Cities and Canopies, the three book of Indian cities published by Penguin, as well as uh, the recent papers also published in Nature, Nature Sustainability and Science. Uh, Professor Nagendra also contributes to the uh, Green Goblin, a monthly column in the Deccan Herald newspaper. So on behalf of Team MP, I welcome you uh, to this city conversation series. And today, uh, Professor Harni Nagendra will speak on thinking ecologically about development in Indian cities. And today, uh, 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 this session will be chaired by Dr. Keith Alverson. Uh, he, Dr. Keith will be, uh, uh, in a very short moment, we expect him to join this session. And apart from this, we have also a very distinguished panelist. We have Professor Chuita Sain from Jawaharlal Nehru University and Dr. Jania Mukherjee from IIT Kharagpur. Dr. Simi Mehta, who is the CEO of M Impact and Policy Research Institute New Delhi and also uh, Mr. Samir Unhale, who is the Municipal Commissioner uh, of uh, Government of uh, Maharashtra, Mumbai. So, uh, uh, so with these few words, uh, just I request uh, Professor Hadini Nagendra to uh, start your lecture, please. So, what do you, ma'am? 
Thank you so much for this uh, very warm introduction and thank you to Impri and other colleagues here for uh, both for this invitation and chance to speak to everyone as well as for conversations I'm looking forward to in this panel. I think it's a very distinguished set of people on the panel and I think the conversations are going to be very extremely interesting. So thank you everyone. Uh, let me just give, please give me a second while I just share my presentation. So I hope you can see this. Yes. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the idea of thinking ecologically about development in India cities, and with the in the, with the background of the fact that we know that India is urbanizing very fast, and um, thinking ecologically about cities often seems like an oxymoron because people look at cities and don't they don't think of places, cities as places of ecology. I've put this lovely photograph, which is. Uh, an area near Mayo Hall, which is one of the city's uh, courts uh, uh, and with majestic rain trees planted by the British and you will uh, I mean, uh, brought into India by the British rather and planted more recently. But these are majestic trees. You can see there's a lot of wildlife around them. And I want to give you a sense of this talk about why we need to think ecologically about India cities. There are a number of uh, excellent books on India cities. But ecology is not thought of, of shaping the character of the cities. And we know that's not true. For instance, Delhi is shaped so much by the character of the Delhi Ridge, the Yamuna River, and it's uh, you know the place as a sort of semi-desertic area where the loo flow comes when it's very hot. Otherwise, it becomes very cold in the winter. The ecology and the geography shapes the air pollution and the other challenges that the city faces. Calcutta, is, you cannot think of Calcutta or Grand Trunk Road without the trees. And we cannot think of Calcutta without the East Kolkata wetlands. You know, they shape the culture in as much and the commerce of the city as much as it shapes the ecology. And uh, unfortunately, still, when you have you have really nice books about Indian cities, but uh, like Maximum City in Mumbai, but uh, ecology is at best a footnote. And this is not only about Indian cities. Of course, this is true of good books on cities across the world. And yet, on the other hand, you have ecologists and until very recently, I would say ecologists had a fascination for looking at so-called pristine landscapes where human beings play a footnote. And of course, in India, you don't have any such pristine landscapes. Uh, that is a Western policy. You have people everywhere. But ecologists typically have not wanted to study cities. So ecological thinking about Indian cities has always fallen through the crack. This is very important for us because by 2000, uh, by 2050, we will be a a world that is 75% urban. And projections indicate that India itself might become more than 50% urban. So this is a UN map which shows you the size and the shape of largest growing cities. India has three of the world's largest cities, Mumbai, Kolkata, Delhi, and also three of the world's fastest growing cities, Surat and Faridabad, and I cannot remember the third right now. But overall, we have very fast growing cities, very large cities, and Urbanization, you can see where the reds and the yellows are and the oranges. These are the places where the fastest growing cities are. And these are not the cities that we traditionally think of. When we think of urban, we think of New York, we think of Paris, we think of Hong Kong. These are not those cities. And these are very different kind of cities. These are kinds of cities which have to be built where sustainability challenges would be formidable, but the opportunities are also very large because much of these cities have yet to be built. The kind of urbanization we'll see in the next 30 years is really someplace where we can influence what is going on. I'll give you another example. Here's an example from the nightlight satellites images, which gives you a sense of lights on, which is cities growing, and lights out, the cities are were shrinking. And here's a blow up of two places. You can see the US as opposed to India. And you can see India is really in a place, uh, situation where lights are growing, lights are coming on. Urbanization is impacting practically every part of India, except maybe some uh, parts of central India, Odisha, some parts of the Thar Desert area, and not even parts of, I would say, the Himalayas, because even now you can see that urbanization is taken, across the, taken over across the Northeast. Whereas in the US, you do see large parts of the area, for instance, around Texas and many other places where industrialization has uh, dropped, and you can see cities are shrinking. So it's a very diff. All I'm trying to tell you is that the context of Indian urbanization is very different. Urbanization in the south, in the global south context, which is all of the cities which are, um, let's say, in Af different parts of Africa or Latin America or uh, in uh, South Asia, are very different from urbanization in the global north. And yet, where does our data on urban sustainability come from? 
So we did an analysis in uh, 2018 where we looked at the top papers over a decade of work on urban sustainability. And when I say top papers, I mean the top cited papers. And we looked at the number of citations versus the percentage of authors that came from the global north. This is not a surprise, but I think the numbers shocked us even. So you see that North America is one third, Europe is another third. And then you have uh, China, which is 20% of the papers are from China on China. If you take the rest of it out, what else do you have in the global south? Half of a percent. And in India, it's 0.1%. So 0.1% of the top thousand cited papers in global sustainability over an entire decade come from India. Now, why is this important? Because what are we doing to shape urban sustainability? We are looking at these top cited papers and urban theories and books and things that influ are influenced by this kind of research. But this research does not come from the Indian context and it is not suited to the Indian context. You can see the differences. We further went into looking at changes in uh, global north or the developing countries, the blues, versus the global south or the developing countries, transition developing low income countries, the greens. And you can see that the white line in the middle of the box, which is the average population growth rate over every 15 year period from 1970s onwards, the global south has been growing at a significantly faster rate. The global south has very different sustainability challenges. If you look at UN databases on infrastructure development, on city prosperity, quality of life, environmental sustainability, the global north, which is again the blues, are in much better shape. Cities in the global south are floundering. They have low youth and they have high rates of youth unemployment, very high under five mortality rates, low access to water, good water, high amount of slums, low access to the internet. This is very important because I'll link this to smart cities later, high homicide rates, a variety of different things, literacy rates, ex exposure to air pollution, PM10 concentrations, states of poverty. We can see that these cities have very different challenges from the global north. So, Purely in terms of data, they have very different challenges. Why is this important? Because you typically have a situation where, like I said, you have this urban theory that is driven by the kinds of papers that we saw, the one third, typically the one third of papers from the US and the one third of papers from uh, Europe. So between them, that 70% of the papers, that more than 70% of the papers that come from North America and Europe. This shapes the methods of inquiry. And that influences the kinds of practice that we do in our cities, the way in which we design our cities. And we have not thought about this sufficiently. So I'll give you some examples of what kinds of ill-designed practice can lead to in the next half of my presentation and finally in the next third of my presentation. And finally, in the last third, moving from ill-designed practice, I want to talk about how locally embedded research can be important in guiding us towards better practice. So Southern imaginations are neither, so typically we look at anthropocentric views of cities or views of nature and biocentric. Should we protect nature for nature's sake, biodiversity for its own sake, or because it's useful to us? In Indian cities, it's simply impossible. These are photographs from across uh, Bangalore, but they could be from anywhere. Look at that old gentleman we saw in a street in Jayanagar, going for a walk in the morning, but he stops to pray to a tree as he goes for his everyday walk. Or this man below with his cow, which is being washed in a lake in Bangalore. These kids from a local slum who hang saris and play from the tree. That is their playground. They don't have playgrounds, but this is their playground. Uh, if you take away this tree, then what do you have left for them to play with? Okay. Or the lady above who had, um, who's, you can see her combing her hair. She has aloe vera in her garden. And when I asked her why, she, it's a very difficult garden to grow aloe vera or to grow any very lovely garden, but very difficult context. There are snakes and there are rats and there is no fresh water. And she has to bring water from a large distance and expensive to water this garden. And I asked her why. She said she has aloe vera in the garden because her daughter planted it before she got married and then left. She keeps it in memory of her daughter. And I said, why did your daughter then plant aloe vera? She turned to me with a laugh and she said, for people like you, you go, people like you go to the parlor, but for people like us, this is our parlor. Now, is this anthropocentric? Is this biocentric? Because there she also has a Tursi that she worships. Another lady from the same slum told me uh, she had a beautiful garden. I went back to two years later to visit the space. And her garden, which is a strip in front of her house, had been taken away because the road expanded. All she had was five pots on her wall and the five pots were full of Tursi. Said you had such a beautiful garden, all kinds of things she was growing. 
how, why do you have five pots full of tulsi? That's all the space you have. And she said, yeah, I didn't plan it. I prepared my pots with manure and I went to visit my daughter and I came back. Tulsi seeds had blown in in the meantime and taken over the pots and uh, they're a guest. How can I kill an, or uh, destroy an unin uh, guest whether it's invited or not invited, right? She said, it's an atiti essentially. And uh, you see that that whole logic. Now, are you saying that's a biocentric logic or an anthropocentric logic? I think these, these questions don't apply. That framing does not apply. For them, it is seamless. For this Dhobi community who washes clothes near the lake in Rajanhali Lake, it is, you know, they pray to the God uh, when they take clothes because they say taking clothes is like a sacred trust. This is research work done by my former PhD student, Hita Unni Krishnan. And what she found when she spoke to them was, if something happens and either clothes get spoiled or they mislay the clothes, then they create a temporary shrine to the god Munishwara and his seven sisters. And they spend the night praying to this god with secret rituals that nobody else is allowed to see. And then they continue to resume their work. And this has to be done with mud that is freshly taken from the lake on the side of the lake in a grove. If you take away that ecology, is there a livelihood? You know, so I, I think this framing of anthropocentrism and biocentrism definitely breaks down into rural settings, but also does not work in the Indian urban setting because the Indian urban setting has a very different way of thinking. It's not urban residents as one would think of as in, New, in, for instance, New York or Paris. I want to give you a few more examples of urban imagination which one can learn from such kind of research. So you have inscriptions on stone and copper from different areas across Bangalore which were discovered. And here's an example of the kinds of texts that you see in these inscriptions that come up again and again. One of them talks about a tank, which is a, one of the lakes and all the wet and dry lands, including the wells underground and the trees overground. And look at the imagination that is inherent in this. There is a sense that this land is life-giving. This, this is a land, uh, it's almost like a land document written on a stone because it's a land rights document granted to a temple. And it says that the trees above ground and the wells are the ground, the life-giving water below ground and the trees which are life-giving above ground are part of this landscape. Who in a survey document would do that today? We look at survey documents, left side, right side, this is the survey number, etc. We don't think of trees above ground. In fact, the first thing one would do is cut off the trees and fill in the well so you can build from end to end. We don't understand, like they understood the importance of this area. Similarly, what you find is if you look at these inscriptions, you will see that the way they invested in nature was, you know, these are uh, examples of uh, inscriptions that people talk about well, who have created lakes for the support of animals, cattle, birds, and all other living beings, the service of the goddess, or a woman who said that in order for her husband and other generation, relatives for 21 uh, generations might ob uh, obtain uh, merit, or in order that dharma might be to his father. Again, this is, you can call this utilitarian, but as a lo along with the idea of the particular relative, it's also for multiple generations. And along with the generations, it is for everything else, animals, cattle, birds, you know. Another thing we have been doing with another colleague, Amrita Sen, is uh, looking at songs of the lake. So she has been documenting, talking to older women in these landscapes, looking at a disappearing memory of songs. There were a lot of oral traditions of singing around these lakes. And this is one of the songs, which is a very well-known song across Karnataka, Male Raya, which is the god of rain. And it says, Voyo, Voyo, Male Raya, pour down god of rain or king of rain. But Male Raya was not asked to pour down alone. He has relatives, mother, children. He has an entire family. And all of them are requested to pour down. Now, what is the process you do? You, a child from that village takes a, a sort of a pan or a basket on his head and goes from house to house. Every house donates a handful of rice and a handful of dal. All of this is brought together and a temporary shrine is made to Malaraya at the side of the lake and a communal feast is cooked in a wood fire and the whole village sits down and eats that food and then they pray to Malaraya. So there is a community feeling involved in it. Even when they ask the Malaraya to pour down, what is in the song? Hirenhaldi, Hire Gauda. That is uh, the village Hirenhaldi is Gauda or leader. The village Birenhaldi is Gauda or leader. And they say seven Gaudas of seven villages sit down and talk for a minute, stand up and talk for a minute. So the idea of the community coming together, meeting, and then asking Malaraya to go down is very much there. Again, there's an imagination of not private enterprise to restore a lake, but a community coming together.
we've forgotten these imaginations. When I come back, I was talking about internet, low internet access. What we find in smart city document after smart city document is the idea that technology can somehow help us restore these cities. Now that is ironic because what uh, often happens is restoration is done and it is nature-based restoration. Sometimes it's not very ecologically designed, but it is often designed around recreational services to middle-class and upper middle-class citizens, people like us sitting in here, for instance. There is no space, you know, this is from a protest uh, in Bangalore. There is no space for grazers in this kind of modern city where there, was, there were local residents uh, protesting. The wetlands of Bangalore's largest lake were being taken away uh, by a, uh, a special economic zone. And in uh, defiance of the fact that you need that wetland, not just for the grazers and the other inhabitants and the fishers, but also for the city itself, because if that lake, which is Bangalore's largest lake, dies, what does this mean for the water security of Bangalore? But the opposition that was led into this came up with who's sponsoring NGOs. And this was not an NGO sponsored, this was a local lake groups, you know, completely non-funded uh, group uh, mot, uh, protest. But nevertheless, the old bogey comes up of who's sponsoring NGOs. But if, what, look at the other thing. We want Bangalore to be Singapore. So we don't need wetlands. We don't need grazing. We don't fish, need fishing. We don't need wetlands. Bangalore must pick up Singapore. Ironically, what is Singapore doing? Singapore has had a vision of a garden city. Then they said there's a city in a garden. And now they're saying it's a, it's a seamless kind of an integration because the entire island should become like a garden. And so they are moving progressively into integrating nature. Whereas we are saying we want Bangalore to be Singapore and our imagination of Bangalore as Singapore is skyscrapers, no wetlands. So you can see in these smart cities that all of these uses are being excluded. Tobies are taken out, grazers are taken out, migrant workers are taken out, women who forage for weeds are taken out. You get end up with a lake like this, where the area for the lake is very minimal. You have a wide jogging path, a fence, and a number of restrictions on use. You can understand why alcohol is prohibited, but why would flower pluck, uh, plucking be prohibited? Why is damage? Of course, you don't want to damage plants and trees, but why would you prevent somebody from sustainably harvesting some of these things? I'll just go back to the previous photo. You will see in all these lakes that there is some sewage that makes its way in. There is grass. Cows used to keep this grass in check because there is excess biomass, there's nitrogen and phosphorus that increase to an increase in grass and cows were your natural way of harvesting this biomass. Now, when you take the cows and the grazers out, you're not just destroying the lake uh, socially, you're destroying the lake ecologically, right? So, but unfortunately, these are the kinds of restrictions on use, even in the few lakes where there are groups that have restored it, who are cognizant of this and want to bring grazers in, the government does not allow it because they have certain ideas of what a restored lake should be and a restored lake in a modern city like Bangalore does not have place for fruiting trees. No fruiting trees should be planted because people will fight about whom the fruit belongs to. I think we should think a bit about what that imagination of the city is and what was that imagination of the city uh, when of, or, or the Bangalore landscape it was before it was a city when uh, we talked about the trees above ground and the wells below ground. What was the imagination of Malaya? And what is the imagination today where we don't want fruiting trees planted anywhere on public spaces because people will fight about whom the fruit belongs to. And I think that's a very sad reflection of where we think urban society has come to. I don't think it's urban society has come to that, but the, that planning imaginations have been restricted to this. Now, what kinds of environmentalism also drives cities? So this is the Kaikonduli Lake, a lake near my house. And uh, we have done a lot of work, uh, like I said, with uh, Amrita Sen, Hita Oni Krishnan, Seema Mundoli, various colleagues, in understanding motivations. Some of the work we've done is looking at environmental placemaking. This was Amrita's work, uh, looking at how different groups, once you have a restored lake, what does this lake mean for all the residents around it? So if you look at migrant workers and the workers you will see opposite, uh, across here, they are climate refugees from North Karnataka. Their areas, their villages have dried up. They have all moved to Bangalore. They take a pay cut of 1,000 rupees. If they work in the apartments across, they would get 9,000 rupees a month. If they work here, they get 8,000 rupees at the lake. But they will take that pay cut, which is significant for them because they want their children to grow up in a safe environment. It's dusty and it's not safe for this boy and other children that they have always around them to grow up in that environment where it is a building under construction. And just like us, they would be willing to take that pay cut. 
but the pay cut is much more significant all i'm trying to say is we tend to think in all of these that the poor are not interested they don't they cannot afford to think about the environment but of course they they do and they care as much as all of us or even more than us village residents like the lady here below um, uh, deepa gehra was talking with great eloquence about this this lake and she says she is the dattaputri of the lake because she was baptized at the lake and uh, her family for generations she took us around the lake her imagination is completely different she says here is a well here is this farmer's land and here is you know she showed us the locations of 13 wells around this landscape and we couldn't see now you only see skyscrapers everywhere you don't see a single well in so she has a different imagination of this landscape there are transgender community uh, people who say that they come to the lake because they can sit and look at the water and nobody judges them and nobody threatens them and nobody throws them out parents of special needs children who ironically say exactly the same thing from a different point of view my son can come here and let off steam because nobody judges him and then he goes to school a happier child right so this is not a story of one city across the global south we have incomplete theorization and inappropriate methods that leads to ill designed planning this is a real tragedy now in the last part of my talk i want to just spend about maybe 10 minutes discussing what can we do then because i don't want to leave us with just challenges i think we all know the challenges and uh, there's i think on this panel everybody has been working on cities has pointed this out what can we do it's a few insights now this is by no means a complete story it's just sharing some experiences from our own work better integration of methods into planning through place based research and i'll give you three examples one is looking at the importance of trees we started looking actually this is what drove me into urban research in 2006 Bangalore was having a wide scale uh, scale tree felling at that time for road widening in a number of places, and uh, we started looking at street trees and street tree diversity. And uh, we, I was working with several undergraduate students then, who started working with simple things like documenting street trees on a road that was going to be cut. Then we started sharing our research, and at one place that really influenced me. uh there was a large in a five star hotel one of these odd conferences that you have on urban sustainability in a five star hotel with bottled water and air conditioning when the temperature is outside is perfectly you know in good shape and i'm sure we've all seen places like this but in one of those places there was um, a discussion on seed balling and tree growing and uh, guest after guest stood up and talked about the importance of trees then one gentleman stood up and in kannada he said it was so it, the look given the place most of the conversation was in english and he spoke in fluent kannada he said he was a pun at the vidhan sauda and uh, we, and he said uh, that which is the um, uh, parliament uh, the state uh, uh, parliamentary house and what he said was you know all you esteem dripping with sarcasm all you esteemed people are coming and telling me about the importance of trees but really which idiot doesn't like trees i mean translator from kannada he said I like trees. You like trees. What's the point of telling me trees are nice? I want to get from work to office. I sit in a bus. I get stuck because the traffic doesn't move, and I need to get to my office fast. I go half an hour late. My pay is docked, and I wish you people would not talk about trees so much. Let's just cut the trees. Keep the trees outside. And so we came back and discussed this. The students and I. One of them came up with this very nice idea. He said, "People care about health. We cannot give them all these emotional arguments about trees. Let's look at health and the impact on pollution." So we did this very simple study. We looked at ten roads across the city, and during the same day, during the same time, on the same road, so all conditions are the same. One stretch of the road, like the stretch above, with trees. One stretch of the road, like the stretch below, without trees. Because in every road, you will have some stretches that are bare of barren of trees. You suck uh, air for eight hours through. You get uh, without trees, you get something on the right, a black filter. Without with trees, it becomes light gray. and this must be the lungs of especially the poor who are people who live on the side of the road okay a quantitative graph suspended particulate matter levels come down to within permissible levels just by having trees on the road sulfur dioxide levels come down ambient air temperatures reduced by 3 and 1/2 degrees road surface temperature tar uh, temperature tar asphalt temperature reduces by 25 to 30 degrees just by having trees this is the road surface this is very important because with the combination of climate change and urban heat island effects we have seen projections that say by end of the century cities might increase by 7 to 10 degrees that means asphalt tar melting temperature we've already seen this in a couple of cases in rajasthan for instance where tar melted 3 years ago and people could not walk 
how will you have a situation if you have hot cities and tar melts and you can't move around? You need to have trees on roads and all we are doing across our cities, whichever city you do, it's cutting Delhi, Calcutta, Bombay, Bangalore. I mean, we're all cutting trees, Coimbatore, Salem. We're, we're cutting trees across the across India on roads and we're not planting them back on roads, right? So I think this, this in fact, of all our work, this received the greatest media attention and the greatest attention from common residents of the city because it's something everybody can relate to, their health. Right. So I think, and I also think it's very important that uh, it was Sujay's idea. So the one of the people who drove this was an undergraduate student, Sujay Velsheri. It was his idea. And I think, again, that is the importance of getting undergraduate students who are from a city involved in driving some of this research. Because they engage with the problem. I would not have thought of it, frankly. I mean, this really in response to this man's question, how does one generate research that convinces people? The second is a project we've been working on now. It's on bird traits because all we all want to have uh, a city as a place of biodiversity and birds are a very important part of keeping people interested in biodiversity. Unless people are interested in nature, why would they care about nature? And I think birds are a very good way of getting people interested in nature. And uh, this is a, a review of more than 230 papers uh, by two colleagues of mine, Swarup um, and uh, Ravi. And we have been looking at what drives bird traits. And we find this few very simple things. First of all, there is hardly any research. You can see the map, hardly any research outside Europe and North America. So they're temperate countries, their research may not translate to our context. Secondly, what you do find is that a few things that, are, that really point to planning. For instance, birds are changing because it's very dangerous uh, to, I mean, eggs get eaten, fledglings get eaten by feral cats, dogs. So they have larger broods. And because of that, they're not able to feed them properly. Now, can you do certain kinds of design, for instance, not for all species, but for certain species to have nests of a certain kind or nest boxes of a certain kind? Secondly, you find that birds tend to shriek or call at much higher frequencies than they do otherwise. So in a city, because there's a low rumble of traffic noise, which is low vibration, to make themselves heard, they call at a very high frequency. And as for us, imagine speaking at a high pitch, it's very exhausting. So the moment it's weekends or holidays, they reduce to their normal pitch. And this impacts other factors. You know, it stresses their hormones, it stresses their reproductive cycle. So again, if you have a park or a lake, if you can screen it with tall trees to make that place a little quieter, it makes it a safer environment for birds. Number of points from this, all the thing is you need that embedded research to understand what, uh, how to shape, shape cities. The third is a very interesting piece of research that Dhruti Somesh and Rohit Rao read, led recently from the university again. And uh, this is to look at foraging. You know, we used to find a lot of women foraging around these lakes, but whenever you talk to policymakers, they say, oh, that is peri urban and in the city, nobody forages. So we did a sample of 200 women from low income households from the center of the city to a gradient outside. And we found that they forage from 80 different species. They had knowledge of 80 different species, 200 households. That's all we've done. 80 different species. The women in the city don't forage because they say it's all dirty land and we don't know where to forage from. Women outside the city forage. But even in the city, we found flourishing markets where you can go because many of these rare plants are very good for knee pain, for improving your brain power, for ridding your child of worms, for all kinds of things. They know the medicinal properties of all of these. We have stopped eating any of these. And so you can go to a woman in Banashankari market and place an order, say, I want this vegetable, uh, this greens, and she will go and forage and next week you come back and pick it up from. So there's a flourishing market we were not aware, right? So this is the, uh, what we've done along with a piece of research that was published, we're coming out with a booklet which will tell you about these edible weeds and give you some recipes. I'll end with this. I think we need to reimagine nature as part of a healthy city. This is wonderful work by an undergraduate intern who was working on this project on edible weeds, Rohit Rao. And you see, this is a lovely imagination. I don't know why we can't have the skyscrapers in the city along with the people foraging, along with the grazers, along with all of this. So this to me is really where we would like to leave our imaginations of nature as part of the city and redesigning cities to think ecologically in a very different way. With that, I'll sign up. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Professor Harini, for your very interesting presentation. Like it uh, gives us some very interesting stories as well, and uh, uh, like the uh, 
uh, what I understood from your presentation is that uh, that understanding and managing the city uh, from an ecological perspective, uh, at, it actually Im implies a conceptual switch from uh, the uh, dominant urban analysis. In fact, in fact, cities, uh, it seems that they cannot no longer be thought of only as a, as a physical artifact. They must be environmentally balanced, taking into account the dynamic relationships. Some of uh, these relationships are visible, some of them are not visible, which exist among the various domains of a, a larger terrain of uh, urban as well as uh, the, as, uh, the, the adjoining areas. And these urban developments or the redevelopments, they should be guided. For example, you mentioned about the smart cities. So, so the urban developments or, or the redevelopment should be guided by a sustainable planning and, and a management vision that promotes the, uh, some kind of interconnectedness, the livability of the communities uh, that protect the historic, the cultural, the environmental resources and, and a balance between uh, sort of built and, 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 and natural systems. So, so which also means that, uh, that, that the growth should be responsible, the development strategies uh, should be broader in vision and, and more regional, regional in scale. So once again, thank you uh, for uh, this very interesting presentation. And uh, I think we uh, still, uh, uh, Dr. Keith uh, has not been able to join with us. So uh, uh, let me just uh, move over to Professor Suchurita Sen uh, for his comment, for her comments, observation uh, on your presentation. And Professor Suchurita Sen uh, is, uh, uh, teaches at uh, Center for the Study of Regional Development, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. So it's over to you, uh, Professor Sen. Thank you. So I, I thought it was absolutely fascinating uh, presentation of how I would if I mean I also work on uh, not exactly this I want work on labor and the relationship between nature you know natural resources and livelihood from a slightly different perspective so I think it shows firstly the importance of the interdisciplinarity of it the way I mean there was a huge amount of value addition as to how different people could look at a problem and still connect with each other. Uh, so I think the first thing which really fascinated me was your, I, I mean, I'm kind of paraphrasing and I'm taking on from what you have spoken, but uh, I, what really struck me was the idea about the coexistence of people and nature and as to how you made the point about the poor actually uh, not only wanting to do something about it, I'll go one step further that the environmental services of the cities, I think, are required far more by the people living at the margin. And that is the reason why they would also go that extra mile to preserve the kind of environment. I think, I mean, that that's a point which is very, very close to my heart. So that that's one thing I take. Uh, now, I, I think I have broadly three kind of comments uh, to, to make. Uh, the first is that, um, you know, uh, the people, I mean, the kind of cities that we are building, I mean, I, I am happy that you have ended in an optimistic note, maybe that is one place where I'll depart a little bit, but starting from how we make our cities and who the city belongs to. So I, I think we will have to have a kind of convergence between the development policy with the environmental vision. It has to be built into that. It can't be an additional thing and a box to tick. So it, it, we have to look at a future of the city with the vision that, uh, you know, the city is uh, perceived in the future. But I actually currently see the development regime going very far from it. I, I see it totally departing from it. So that, that's my, uh, you know, reason for pessimism probably. So I would like to kind of give three examples of, and, and let me talk since you make this point about poor, let me take it forward. Uh, you know, maybe I'll give you just three examples where the three sets of poor, all of whom actually actively contribute to the making of the city, but are do not ultimately belong to the city. So the first category that I can think about, are, which you also mentioned, migrant workers. 
and the they come from outside and and there is this phd uh, done under me which i'm depending on to draw from it that they actually when they asked uh, they they are uh, very very i mean the kind of situation that they live in and also uh, you know the kind of facilities they have access to it's pathetic so they are they are really living in temporary shanties and so on and so forth so they never do belong to the city and in spite of the fact that they have access to very little environmental services they do not feel that the city is their place so they always i mean we have seen the crisis of the migrant workers very recently so when when put in a crisis people have walked miles back to their homes so city was not their home now now the point which you made about the poor and the environment will not happen unless and until we we, if we make the city belong to them and they have to be part of it and included as a part of it the second example i would like to give is this uh, abrupt throwing out of the slum dwellers in the name of cleaning up the city so you just remove bodies from the city and throw them out relocate them to make it and that's also a point to bring out to make it a global city and how disparate this imagination is with uh, you know something which is environmentally sustainable so uh, so we are not really embracing the historicity of the relationship between people and the environment which is another point you bring out in your uh, this thing so so that and the third category which comes to my mind are the people whose land are lands are acquired to spread the city and then they are thrown out so earlier they would have been a part of the city but now they are not i mean they are somewhere in the fringe and further into the fringe so i think uh, we have to ask this question and i'm asking it more from a and that is where i think interdisciplinarity really helps that i think we have to really ask this uh, question more from a social perspective where we will answer or address or talk to many of the issues that you are talking about as to who the city belongs to who's who has the right to the city so that you know if you make people belong and if they are dependent on environmental resources if you empowered them in terms of which is also over a period of time being taken away I and mean, i'll i'll refer to it at the end in terms of one of the examples and we had this discussion <clears throat> in the npri one of the discussion sessions we had on the eia 2020 notification so that that's a case in point uh, the second thing i would like to talk about is from one of my the work that i did in hyderabad which is just an example but the point which i wish to make is that that the ecology of the city uh, is uh, of course very very important and all of the points why it is important you have made those points but it does not stop there it is far more important than it seems to be uh, you know from from the uh, from just the perspective of health or uh, you know uh environment cleanliness and things like that and and the quality of living it actually has an impact on the inequalities and it it actually has a bearing on how the society will function so one of the examples which i would like to give is the intense pollution which we see in the peri urban water context so one of our work in the peri urban uh, areas in hyderabad showed that because you pollute the underground and the surface water that in creates a market for safe drinking water which encourages private players to uh, you know supply water from ro system which is priced and the poor are not able to access it so this gives rise to new forms of inequality and when we actually measure the water of how much water just drinking water how much water the poor and the rich drink they actually poor end up drinking less water than the rich number one number two in the lean season when the prices go up and the consumption go up the gap is even more so what i'm trying to say is this environmental i mean this uh, messing with the hydroecology in this particular context actually gives rise to new forms of inequality and and i think that is a far reaching impact of how 
a non i mean a, a city which which may have been sustainable earlier which is going into a different direction could produce unequal societies so uh, taking on from where where you were uh, you had finished and the third thing which i want to actually uh, focus on are the we have to actually look at the processes of growth what is the what are the roots through which we are growing now we have a blind so so the kind of uh, uh, you know economic regime that we are current currently into it gives a primacy to economic growth so at the cost of everything else at the cost of environment at the cost of distribution at the cost of equity and and any other forms of social cohesion so i i think that we do in some way and that is where again where my pessimism comes from that uh, you know we have to really stop thinking about growth being the ultimate end to our route that it is not it is a means to an end and i i think more than that how we grow is very important the roots for growth is important so so you might grow very fast but you can grow in a very very unsustainable manner so uh, I, i would say that a 3% growth in a sustainable manner is preferable to a 10% growth which we really laud all the time i i i mean i don't have time but i mean i think this can be extended or expanded on and i would like to end a little bit about uh, the you know one of the examples of uh, the direction that we are going in terms of the environmental impact assessment notification which when you when you, when you read it carefully number one I, i think the main problem which i have and this is there in all the policies that we are having that if you have have this imagine this three uh, nodes of the government the citizens of the people and the private sector which is uh, spurring the growth the government is swaying far more uncomfortably closer to the private sector and the corporate sector and away from the citizens so the citizens on their own and that is where i feel i mean i take your point of the independent research and i have no doubt in my mind that these are very very important and vital but i think the means to make a difference is being taken away from us i think i mean the citizens voice for example the public hearing how much of public hearing is allowed for which kind of project and and many of them are actually urban projects are being uh, you know taken away that is number one number two the kind of documentation and scientific evidence we used to have earlier in any kind of uh you know development project that is reduced so the citizens don't even know what is happening so earlier we used to be aware of what what is happening and one could actually go to the court with all that material so what i'm trying to say is over a period of time while this micro level work are very important and crucial i mean absolutely crucial i don't disagree with you but the mechanisms by which we could make a difference that instrument is being taken away so unless i i really don't have an answer as to how we can re, you know kind of redirect the trajectory towards something which is much more citizen oriented and i think the main point of departure is the cities would earlier historically organically develop now what is happening a new landscape is being superimposed on the old landscape so so the all elements of historicity connection with the nature people and nature is being done away with so you have this uh, you know fly over the multi storied building the malls and all of this being superimposed on to a landscape which was earlier quite organic represented a organic relationship with, between people and the environment so i really think we need to depart from this mechanism of city making and the process of city building uh, 
uh, where I do think that, uh, you know, citizens' involvement, making them aware, you made this point about the media attention, I think it's extremely important to, to make all the work which is being done counted and having, uh, you know, kind of uh, presented it by the media. And but, but I think we have to work out somewhere together, put our heads together to figure out how, what is that process through which we can make a difference. Thank you very much. I'm sorry that I put a very pessimistic view of the world. So thank you. Thank you, Professor Sen, for making very interesting as well as some provocative points. So the challenges are really uh, daunting for the Indian cities. And uh, I'm sure that Professor Hardini will be, will offer us some, uh, yes, some optimistic viewpoints, like how we can approach our, in, or how, how can we make the Indian cities more inclusive, more climate resilient and so on and so forth. But before that, and I now request uh, Dr. Jania Mukherjee, uh, who teaches at the uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, uh, to uh, have her comments and observation. Yeah, first of all, uh, thank you, Harini ma'am. And uh, I have always been an admirer of your works. So I have enjoyed uh, the presentation thoroughly. And I think like in the, from the very beginning itself, uh, when you talked about uh, this, uh, uh, I mean, why uh, biocentric and anthropocentric uh, binaries are actually very, very problematic. And being a student of environmental history, I immediately, you know, I can relate uh, or resonate uh, to uh, Bram Chandra Buha and uh, Joan Martinez Elias, very uh, old work, but which was extremely influential for us uh, when we were uh, master students, varieties of environmentalism. Essays, uh, I mean, uh, global, uh, very kind of uh, make a distinction, made a distinction between uh, ecology of affluence versus environmentalism of the poor. So, and, you know, your examples also show that how our urban environmental imaginations are imaginations of all these, uh, I mean, all these people, all these social groups and actors who uh, make, uh, remake uh, urban nature. Uh, and how it, why and how it is also important, uh, you know, to also capture this uh, micro uh, political realities, situatedness, uh, environmental placemaking, everydayness, whatever we can conceptualize it uh, in by using different terminologies, but you know the essence uh, remains the same. So I think this is very very important and crucial. Uh, second, I think like you know uh, again some examples which you gave, uh, you gave the cow example that you know when the this uh, these lakes uh, now these lakes have become fenced so cows are no more allowed and i also think that you know why it is important for us to also understand the importance of human non-human entanglements uh, in these you know uh, ecological spaces and why we should also understand uh, these realities from the perspective or prism of these complex uh, uh, interactions uh, among city nature and technology so for example, again, uh, so far as Kolkata is concerned, uh, Kolkata uh, has, I mean, almost I think no cow sheds, right? maybe one or two. And this, uh, this is a very small piece of news. So if I say a policymaker that, you know, Kolkata has no cow shed, so he or she would immediately say, you know, what's the big deal? So why are we even discussing this when we are discussing ecology in cities? But I can tell you that, you know, that Kolkata has uh, no cow shed now, how it has impacted the nature of waste in the, uh, or the nature of wastewater in the East Kolkata wetlands. And uh, I mean, it will really not be an exaggeration if I say that, you know, this kind of, uh, uh, which may appear a kind of a small example, but the kind of impact it has, even on art system, I think is huge. Because all of us, we are now aware of the larger inter interconnections uh, of, you know, these kind of changes uh, across uh, local, regional and global scales. So I think this is very, very important. So it's quite important to, uh, to observe, you know, what kind of changes are uh, really going on and how uh, these changes are shaping uh, urban ecological uh, dynamics or dialectics. Third, I think like Shuchodita Ma'am's point is also very, very relevant that, you know, we are talking about nature, we are talking about urban nature. So what is this nature? Whose nature? How nature? Why nature? So these questions become very, very important. And again, if I think we uh, kind of deploy uh, environmental humanities or political ecology uh, lenses or lenses or you know, frameworks, then uh, I think the, this question also becomes very, very important that what is not natural in nature? So why it is important for us to understand, you know, the cityscapes uh, as, as, as complex social natural assemblages and why it is important to incorporate the needs, interests, aspirations, agendas 
of anyone and everyone under the sun, you know, inhabiting uh, uh, cities or cityscapes of India. So I think a final, the final comment which I would like to make is that, you know, uh, 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 so I read uh, Karl Polanyi's The Great Transformation. And uh, Polanyi talks about you know how this uh, capitalist system or the capitalist economy it it is it, it, I mean so, so he was, he is I think he's a father of uh, this particular terminology called disembeddedness. So I think why it is important for us to really you know uh, uh, I mean how do we how do we uh, uh, focus on or or how do we understand this disembeddedness and also try to think about ways or innovative pathways. Through which re-embedding can actually happen. So, so it's very, very important to actually, you know, understand the context. What is a major problem with the smart city discourse or doctrines and practices? I guess that uh, this disembeddedness is a crucial or key feature, you know, in this uh, smart city uh, approaches or the, even in the smart city mission. So I think it's very, very important for us to kind of uh, uh, contextualize, uh, uh, contextualize like uh, technological uh, uh, plans or you know uh, uh, big, big plans, mega plans within the within the uh, social, uh, political, cultural, you know, all these realities that remain enmeshed together and uh, you know uh, as part of uh, urban nature. So I think Hadini Ma'am's like uh, presentation is very, very important. And I think like uh, thinking uh, ecologically or this ecological thinking finally uh, uh, help us or enable us that why is it important to think about, uh, you know, or, or rather to think about a shift in this idea of from ecology in to ecology of finally to ecology for cities. So then we are, you would be making cityscapes you know, uh, and, you know, not uh, get, I mean, the, there will be less scope for this citadelization or ghettoization or gentrification, but, you know, rather more scope of, you know, uh, these uh, cityscapes uh, to become more and more inclusive. So I think this ecological thinking uh, would be very, very uh, important. And, uh, and all these different examples, small examples, but examples, uh, uh, you know, uh, and as Shruti I also mentioned that interdisciplinarity, and how different kinds of observations and uh, when we have to uh, think ecologically, I think uh, all these various lenses, uh, all these frameworks, all these discourses, everything, it has to be very, very comprehensive and inclusive. And the best part uh, of this presentation, I guess, I mean, my take uh, from this would be, you know, how uh, we can think about, how we can think about, uh, about, about. I, I, I again, again, I'll not be interested to use sustainable green and those kind of things. And maybe I'll not use any term for that matter, but, uh, you know, uh, how we can think about uh, cities that are really uh, not smart, unsmart, I guess. Thank you. So thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Jeannie. And then let me now uh, just request uh, 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 Dr. Simi Mehta, who is the CEO of Impact and Policies Institute, uh, to chip in and uh, make her comments or observation. Yes. yes, am I audible? So what do you, yes. Um, yes, good evening. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Harini. And uh, before I make my comments, I we just heard from uh, Dr. Keith because he's traveling from Japan to uh, the United States. So there's some uh, challenges with respect to his uh, internet, etc. So he is unable to connect this morning, and it is quite early. So he has um, expressed his you know, sent his greetings as well as expressed his apologies as well. So kindly accept. Thank you so much. So uh, thank you again, uh, Professor Harini, for your wonderful presentation. It is it was so insightful, um, and uh, Professor Suchorita and um, Dr. Genia for adding uh, their comments. I would uh, also like to uh, take in or uh, end, uh, begin with the tail end of uh, what uh, um, Professor Suchorita said about uh, the interdisciplinarity of uh, sustainable environment. In fact, this is actually very, very clear and evident from my own very work, uh, which is on um, uh, urban food security, urban agriculture, and urban soils, and also climate change, uh, for which most of which I acknowledge uh, my 
Fulbright PhD supervisor, Professor Ratan Lal, uh, who, is, uh, who was the 2020 World Food Prize uh, laureate. So uh, in fact, uh, a lot of the work on urbanization, the implications of urbanization, uh, which, which is actually a key ingredient uh, for uh, our countries, for any country's development. Uh, but the whole idea of its of it being unrestrained and unplanned uh, has often compromised upon the uh, social stability. And uh, this often translates into uh, the environmental and ecological challenges. And um, as a result, I would say one of the casualties of uh, urbanization is, is the environment, a direct casualty. Um, so uh, climate change has actually added a lot to the challenges of um, challenges like environmental extremes like droughts, floods, etc. Which you yourself had mentioned, uh, people from North uh, Karnataka uh, traveling to Bangalore uh, as as migrant laborers, and then uh, when we also see the whole amount of uh, discharge of uh, effluents uh, from uh, from uh, households uh, industries etc into the city lakes rivers that if if they pass through um, into the water bodies uh, they have been problematic this has actually added to the problem of soil degradation the urban soil degradation and this has become um, soils have become toxic elements like arsenic and other compounds they uh, they entirely contaminate the whole um, uh, whole systems and then it it actually leads to problems in the health problems of health uh, for the people and those at the receiving end are uh, the poor and the vulnerable who really cannot afford uh, water filtration etc and um, good uh, good quality water and then increasing greenhouse gas emissions uh, from the from the industry. So the natural environment is certainly at a very pitiable state. Um, one another aspect uh, I would again point out uh, is about the rural to urban migration. Um, wherein uh, we are actually currently pursuing a study uh, on uh, on how uh, how uh, migrant workers uh, um, I mean, workers are traveling from uh, the Sundarban Delta areas because they are faced with uh, climate ex uh, excesses in uh, towards, they are moving towards, um, mostly towards Aurangabad, Maharashtra and um, other other city uh, cities in the country for, uh, for the sake of livelihood. But here our study points out that most of them are willing to live, continue to, uh, they would like to continue to live in, in these cities because uh, uh, their uh, their challenges of uh, climate excesses is totally different. Uh, they would not uh, their their houses have been totally uh, destroyed and uh, all those. So and plus they do not have agricultural land uh, in their hometowns, home villages rather, uh, where they can at least uh, seek to begin their uh, their work. So in fact, again, uh, this again highlights the lives of the people are in perils. Um, uh, closely associated with, with this point is that uh, urban agriculture, the need for urban agriculture, urban and peri-urban agriculture has really not yet gained that momentum, that much of momentum, which uh, we have been um, in our studies, we have been trying to uh, argue. Uh, and then urban forests, it is just a matter of um, aesthetic, you know, aesthetics that uh, uh, if you have this much amount of land, then you can have uh, forests, but that is not really a concern. Um, what could be your views on this? Um, well, in uh, urban agriculture, there has been uh, some small private investments, you know, that aquaponics, hydroponics, etc. But uh, this is not still being advocated at the policy level to the uh, as vigorously as uh, it should be. Um, as you have pointed out, uh, your your uh, respondents have been growing aloe vera, tulsi plant. So, uh, but this is all very limited to home gardening. Uh, but uh, again, entrepreneurship, etc., um, needs to be brought in here in order to have some um, good amount of um, uh, environmental protection uh, or uh, even aesthetics, uh, for that matter, in into the cities. Um, so, uh, and, and one last point before I would end is that, uh, you know, for uh, India's intended national determined contributions, INDCs, uh, India has sought for climate financing 
from the developed countries. Uh, and again, technology transfers and R&Ds that would happen. And as we are moving towards COP26 this year, uh, and um, do you think this would be really in line with India's Atm Nirbhar Bharat plan? Um, so, or what should be, you know, what according to you uh, is the policy recommendation um, according to which we should approach uh, the COP26 agenda this year? So with this, I will like to end and I would like to listen more about uh, your, your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Simi. And today we uh, have another discussion with the panelist, uh, uh, Mr. Samir Unale, who is the Joint Commissioner of the Municipal Administration Department Government of Maharashtra. So now I request uh, Mr. Unale uh, to make his comments or observation. It's over to you. Yes. Uh, hello, very good evening. Uh, this is uh, Samir here. Uh, actually, still in my office, I am so, uh, with my mask, so sorry about that. Uh, I think uh, cities and the uh, uh, green, uh, green cities or cities with trees is uh, not a very new idea. Uh, in fact, I still remember the poem of, you know, of uh, Mahakavi Kalidas when he had written uh, Meghdut, when he is describing uh, the city, uh, his city, uh, to the Megh, he is describing all gardens and orchards and you know, all the trees which are in his city where his beloved is staying. And so you will find even the association of dense cities, so to say. And uh, what we are discussing now is not very far, despite the you know, centuries that have gone through. So what it really means is that uh, somewhere uh, the resonance of, of the trees and uh, uh, humanity per se and our habitats has been a very strong one. And it remains and continues to be strong. Uh, in fact, uh, I do recollect one of the news articles in which uh, it was clearly mentioned that I think India had shown substantial increase in the green cover in one of the uh, GIS maps or the satellite remote sensing maps which were flashed over the world. Uh, so at city level, I, I work with cities. So as far as cities is concerned, the uh, association and the methodology of making it happen, uh, you know, statutorily, we all are aware there is a tree act, there is a requirement of permissions for felling of the trees. There is a budgetary provision made for trees. Uh, as far as Maharashtra is concerned, there is a substantial uh, program called as Mazu, Maji Vasundar or My Earth is currently going on in which all the cities are working on the five aspects, uh, including uh, afforestation, urban forestry for that matter. Uh, so what, what, what we're really talking of is to the uh, man to tree ratio or human being to tree ratio of every city. That is something that needs to be improved. I, I really like the point which ma'am made that it is just not aesthetics and ornamental value of trees that we are talking. But the very core, uh, the very basic ethos of the city needs to be connected with the ecosystem of which trees is always a very important part. Uh, then I think, of course, the optimality is the issue, which is a which is a practical uh, issue. We cannot run away uh, or you know take refuge in uh, whatever ideas and dreams. There has to be some practical implementation and solution, and uh, an optimality does evolve. Despite the various, uh, despite the various forces which are interacting, uh, collective wisdom is an emergent phenomena. And even in uh, even the book that you know we had tried to write a uh, couple of weeks back, we were insisting on the concept of collective climate wisdom as one of an important uh, strategy for uh, for us to engage with the challenges of this decade that we're looking at. Trees and cities will have to coexist. Uh, there will have to be some adaptation to be made. We need not just think of aesthetics or just think of an ornamental value of trees. They need to be, we need to have more and more urban uh, forest uh, with us in the city, adjoining cities. Uh, luckily, you know, what the part which I am staying in, uh, we have a big national forest uh, besides us. And, uh, it indeed is a important, you know, important aspect of a city. 
uh, there are many experiments done all over the cities of India. In fact, Amrut program, uh, which we had uh, the, just last uh, plan, it had an important component of greening of the cities and many gardens and urban forestry project came up. Uh, biodiversity rules are there. So what is happening is that you know, we are having uh, many, many policies and many programs and even statutory framework that is conscious of this uh, important correlationship and interrelationship of the uh, forestry or urban forestry or trees and cities beyond the, beyond the aesthetics, beyond the ornamental value. And I'm sure that the drive that, in, in fact, you must be aware that Maharashtra had taken a drive of over uh, 30 crore uh, trees in that space. Yes, there is the issues of, you know, how this, how to sustain it and how to engage the citizens to this uh, larger mission and broader objective. But I think the public, public awareness is increasing. Uh, we are finding greater traction with people when we talk of, you know, any, any programs on environment. Uh, the larger IEC strategy that we are seeing with the uh, climate uh, framework and the other, even from the, even the international agencies, the multilateral agencies and UN agencies, which are trying to you know, uh, promote this idea. And uh, over and large, I am finding a, a larger you know, aligning, aligning of goals, right from the UN framework to a smallest possible cities. There is now an aligning of goals on environment on sustainability, on, you know, uh, livability of a city and uh, deconcretizing the city of having greater and greater connect with the environment and nature and biodiversity. So yes, so, so I think the major challenge for just for cities now, you know, is to come up with a workable plan and uh, have a framework of executing it despite the various interacting forces that we might be having. So I think the challenge I think is now execution we have uh, last two and three or four decades, there has been substantial discussion in national and uh, international forum about the need and necessity of being environmentally conscious. I think it has now reached to such a stage that probably every most of us are convinced now. So what remains to do is to execute it, to implement it. And while implementing, uh, what we are trying to have is greater, greater citizen participation because funds and uh, programs, uh, and I think there are substantial availability of everything now. So I think uh, uh, what needs to be done now is to work out on having such execution, you know, strategies and best practices and SOPs really to be shared, not only by government or municipality, but the various agencies that are coming up. So I think the, uh, in fact, in urban India for last five decades, for, for last five years, in fact, we talk of smart city and Amrut and Ruday and, uh, the Swachh Bharat, of course, which we had. Even in Maharashtra, we are having the Nagarothan program and the Maji Vasundara program, which are also aligned to the national goals. And uh, this even, uh, in fact, let me tell you, uh, Dr. Sir, even this kind of uh, webinar that you are doing is also a very important contribution of creating this uh, consciousness and uh, raising this awareness. And, you know, there is, a, in fact, in marketing is the last uh, point I will take that before joining, I was doing door-to-door -door marketing uh, of I was selling vacuum cleaners earlier, in my, just after my college. So we used to, in fact, I still remember the lesson of door-to-door uh, -door marketing, which uh, our, uh, my boss used to tell me, that there is a, you know, there's a still moment of cusp, you know, in which the person will buy or not buy your idea or your program, whatever it might be. But that emotional resistance a person has to a particular idea, if there is a you know, typical uh, magic point till which you have to take him and realize and then he, you know, he, he starts uh, implementing that. So I think you know, that calls me off. In fact, uh, nice theory was something that, of course, it has a various different connotation by various academic uh, uh, you know, uh, the themes and theories that we have. But I think when, when, when we are thinking of uh, larger community engagement with the citizens, for a particular program, in this case, which might be, you know, urban forestry, urban trees, a lot of thinking needs to be done. And uh, some behavioral elements, some nudge theory, some, you know, uh, how to get greater uh, uh, monetizing, if you want, monetizing uh, uh, environmental actions in some way is also, you know, in fact, we had tried a program and was working as a CEO smart city of making an app which connected the rack picker, the housing societies and the recycler 
and uh, getting the plastic which gets collected connected with some of the shears and monetizing it as a incentive for behavior behavioral change or behavior which would be bringing uh, bringing you know some uh, uh, change into the person that if a fire society collects a particular plastic and gives it to the recycler via the rack picker via that app this activity was to be incentivized in some way on monetary but for software develop i don't know what it will what stage it gives but these ideas will have to be tried so is the case with you know uh, i remember in it is in 1995 in fact there was a samajik vanikar or the social forestry experiment was done in maharashtra is a very big way almost uh, three decades back and that experiment did give a lot of you know memory parks so it was called as smriti van uh, uh, trees which were done in memory of your you know family or other people and this so i think now for cities a, congress, a bit of deconcretization is necessary we are doing a development is you know equated with concretization which may not be the case a new form of uh, maybe some new things will have to be introduced even in the district manual of you know pwd engineering the public works department will have to bring in some new manuals which will allow greater the ecological system and lesser of concretization and maybe you know tarring of the roads every time and these ideas i think are now finding place i am i'm very hopeful and very confident that uh, we would be in a position to create a significant impact on the cities of india and it this will be led not by any institution or officers this will be led by the common maybe even the uh, school students and you know the girl child they will be the real you know uh, the last point now i think i'm speaking for a bit period i will have to go to my other meeting also that what really differentiates a bullet train and a normal train so i was told that a train is pulled by the by one engine and maybe 25 bogies that's why it doesn't you know get get the speed but when every wheel becomes a engine then it becomes a bullet train that's one of the, the simplest example that someone had given me so i think the similarly when we are talking of community engagement and citizen you know participation in all aspect including environment and urban forestry this also will have a greater you know resonance and traction and uh, uh, more and more ideas and more and more collaboration and more and more sharing of thoughts and identifying and acknowledging uh, individual efforts i think can give a long way of giving uh, india in true sense uh, uh, many green cities and many green patches also in various cities and overall the uh, civil engineering development concepts that we have will have to cater for more and more uh, urban forestry for this and which in fact is being happening despite you know whatever comes into <clears throat> public domain so uh, thank you so, i'm sorry i think i had uh, extended my talk a bit but uh, i think it was great interacting with uh, ma'am because we have read her books and in fact her students used to interact us on how to you know work on lakes and the cities which she did in bengaluru so thank you very much thank you every thank you so much thank you uh, th uh, thank you thank you mr nal and just uh, before uh, just going back to uh, professor hardini uh, just i let me add some of the some uh, two or three points uh, th those are specially related to the implementation aspects of uh, whatever uh, things that we are actually talking about like uh, as you as we know that in, in case of india these urban and rural areas they are actually conceptualized in opposite terms but generally it has been observed that that both are profoundly interconnected and and are linked to a complex economic political and and environmental social fabric so it may be necessary uh, to move away from the current administrative uh, political divisions uh, to boundaries that are defined by natural processes and system and if so so is there any sort of ideal governance structures that can address uh, some of these environmental issues like water food uh, waste energy uh transport biodiversity as well as the urban rural flows and uh, secondly uh, another you, you mentioned about the importance of locally embedded research so uh, so what i uh, like to know that how can such local knowledges and indigenous responses uh, be incorporated within the existing official policy narratives so uh, it's over to you uh, now to respond to the comments and all the queries and all these things ma'am sorry i'm just yeah unmuting myself here yes. thank you this is very rich and i was just trying to take notes as everybody spoke so i make sure i don't uh, miss anything um, so 
I, I just, if you, if nobody minds, I think Mr. Uh, uh, Samir Unhale was saying that he has to leave soon. So I'll just do his comments first. I don't want to lose that opportunity because I think it's also, thank you for putting this panel together. I think it's very rich to have, uh, you know, from academics to planners. It's uh, really, I think this is the kind of conversations we should have. Uh, just to respond to Mr. Unhale's uh, comments, I think there are many very important points you brought up. Uh, don't just think of the ornamental values of trees, absolutely. You know, one of the things we have been thinking of in terms of how do we make cities places of nature again? I don't think we can actually go back to uh, large open spaces in many of these cities. Mumbai, for instance, has no place ready for the large open spaces. We have to get creative. Now, can we do creative things like saying every tree is... Um, I mean, given the real estate space in uh, Mumbai, let us say every tree is, is invaluable, not just for the tree, but for the space it occupies. And we must make best use of that space. You must have fruiting trees. You must have trees which give you shade. You must have trees with uh, that the roots are not concretized, so they do rainwater infiltration. You must have trees of the kinds of leaves that contribute to air pollution. Can you do something that thinks of multifunctionality? So one tree is not the same as another tree. We do not say that uh, planting eucalyptus at large scale, for instance, is considered equivalent to afforestation, but we do our research on what trees suit what landscapes uh, in Mumbai. For instance, in Mumbai along the coast, I know you tend to plant a lot of uh, cashew and uh, this uh, native badam, more native badam actually, and that's a good tree to plant because it's able to survive the coastal winds. And uh, so, you know, can you have that kind of an ecological thinking on, for instance, mangroves, how to get Mumbai's mangroves back? Because I think in terms of climate change, there would be those kinds of impacts. So I think there's a lot that can be done here on uh, design uh, when one is thinking, especially if a city like this has a vision for planting number of trees, which is very nice to know. What kinds of trees should one plant? We, we need much more research. Unfortunately, what we have is we are nursery based, I think. Uh, nurseries tend to have uh, uh, certain kinds of trees and when we want to plant at scale, we, we are uh, forced to do these plants uh, at large scale. I'm speaking from a Bangalore experience admittedly, but this is typically what happens. And then we plant the trees that are available. And uh, how does one uh, get this cycle into place so that we actually land up planting trees that are more uh, possible? I think there's a lot of interface there between research and policy and uh, horticulture that, that needs to be done, which is not happening in the Indian context. I also found your uh, example in Kalidasa very interesting. And in fact, when the British came into Bangalore also, they were very inspired by Kalidasa's idea of Ritu Samhara, that is flowering trees of every season. So Bangalore is uh, structured in such a way that we have trees from across the world so that at any point of time, you have something flowering, adding a splash of color to the landscape. And that brings me to the idea of, uh, you know, uh, thinking of how a few good people can have such a lasting vision and impact. For instance, uh, just post-independence, the people who carried on this planting tradition in, in uh, India have made such a big impact on our cities. And in India, in Bangalore in the 1980s, there was an excellent forest officer, Mr. Negin Hal, who's now in his 90s, who planted so many trees under an Indra Priyadarshini program. And in fact, many of the trees in the culture of Bangalore, when we talk about tree-lined avenues, are all due to that one officer. And as you said, his, his relationship with people, you made a, a point that tree, money is not the, uh, and resources are not the constraint when you have an official backing. What you need is people to support. He went door to door, talk, opening doors, asking residents, what do you want on your street? And then when he planted the trees, they would come out in their buckets. We have done interviews. And uh, you know, entire streets and neighborhoods would be involved in planting the trees. And that is why environmental activism is so, so strong in certain neighborhoods of Bangalore because there was this very intense collaboration. It was not that the government came and planted trees and went away. People were asked and they planted the trees that they wanted. So I think there's a lot to learn from all of these. And um, finally, I'll just end with... I think your uh, insights on uh, this, uh, the psychology and trans uh, of uh, how do we sell this really? I think that is where we, we, we also need to bring in wider constituency because many people, unfortunately, who live in the city are far too busy today to think about the environment. They need the environment in many ways, but they have not been, their eyes have not been open to it. For instance, waste. We know that waste segregation is very easy. And yet it is not done at a fraction. And then uh, it's very difficult to say the government should clean up waste when we are not segregating, when we're not able to do that transition. So I think there's a lot of interesting behavioral research from elsewhere in the world that says that if you get 30% of the people to practice something, 
that's the first difficult part the flip from 30 to 70 percent happens almost automatically because people are influenced by the environment they see around us and then again the 70 to 100 percent becomes very difficult and i know fridays for future the sunrise environmental movement of uh, youth in the us they all a lot of them use this 30 percent number we have no idea if that 30 percent number works in india or not what is our crowd characteristic what are how, you know, how are we influenced we really i think these are very important points and we really need i think one comment uh, uh, that holds, I think, all of these uh, this very fascinating inputs that we have got is that interdisciplinarity is very important. And I'll take this forward by saying, I think Mr. Unhale's uh, presence here in his comments tell us that transdisciplinarity is very important, that we need to actually pose our questions in collaboration with all kinds of people who will use this research. So we are not left as academics uh, saying that we produced this research, it was policy relevant, but policymakers didn't take it forward, maybe because they didn't want that research or maybe it wasn't co-developed with them. So I think that uh, is, is uh, very important. Uh, next, I want to come to Professor Sucharita's points. I completely get your sense of, uh, uh, I am a natural optimist, but even then I find, especially in recent times, my sense of optimism uh, is sorely tested. And uh, so I completely get all of your points. The city is uh, changing in ways that we cannot uh, imagine. And uh, I, uh, I don't know where to go. My sense of hope, I tell you, it comes from certain movements in Bangalore. And I think Bangalore has had a very strong civic consciousness. There have been environmental groups that have been working since the 1970s and 80s on various kinds of agitations. We may not, we may or may not have thought of them as successful because they were not able to stop certain kinds of environmentally destructive projects. But I think they shape, like the, the Madhava Chao Andolan to me shapes environmental thinking in India. You know, whether the movement itself stopped the Sadat Sarova Dam or not, it has shaped environmental consciousness of many people. Similarly, I would say these kinds of movements in Bangalore shaped an entire future generations of urban activists. And there was a steel flyover program in Bangalore where uh, trees were going to be cut, thousands of trees, about two, three years ago, in fact. And a large campaign was mobilized with a lot of uh, protests and including moving the court. And finally, that entire tree felling was stopped. Similarly, there is now movement in the court to try and stop tree felling in different parts of Bangalore. Whether that will succeed or not, we don't know. What we do know is that environmental consciousness is growing. And I think as academics, we have a big role to play. For instance, we have seen, we have done very simple things, independent assessments of trees to be felled. What are government estimates? What are our independent assessments? Our independent assessments, rule of thumb will be always two to three times the number of trees to be felled. Okay? And all we have to do is make that public it's, it takes time and effort. Somebody needs to fund it. I'm fortunate in, to be in, in a university where there's a lot of support for public action. Otherwise, it becomes difficult. Where do you get the people and the resources to do this? But having that independent report really helps to drive any kind of urban civic action by people. So I think more academics, and I see a lot of academics doing this now in different parts of uh, India, definitely. And, you know, Dhrubadurti Ghosh's work on uh, East Kolkata wetlands was so influential in shaping so much of research and action. That is, I think, the kind of models we need to emulate. But, uh, I mean, you had uh, wonderful points, and I think this is, I, I, I take this all, uh, I, 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 I don't think one can disagree. I think the same sense of frustration we all share. I also took your point about interdisciplinarity and, uh, you know, so much of how we look at the city is very, very similar across. We need to find more ways of collaboration of these kinds. Jania, thank you again for all your insights. I thought your story of cows at Kolkata was uh, very interesting in telling us of whose nature are we conserving. When we say East Kolkata wetlands or when we say cows uh, in the city are dirty or are clean or, you know, whose perceptions are these? How can we compare different perceptions? How can we engage people in a way that when there is contestation, but that contestation can be in a way that equalizes a playing field? And uh, we had tried some experiments. You know, there was a, a Dutch PhD student who came in to work on environmental uh, values around slums. And uh, that is also relates to Professor Sucharita's uh, comments. So she had done this work where slums around lakes, uh, looking at how they interacted with the ecosystem services provided by lakes. And one of the things she was very keen on uh, was when she came in that I don't want to consume this as part of my PhD program and go back and get a PhD. Of course, that is part of the PhD, but how can I also make sure that my research gives back to the city? 
So we then held a very interesting exhibition where um, Arti Kumar Rao, who is a very well-known environmental photographer in Bangalore, it uh, took some photographs. Some other people, including the student, uh, she, they also took photographs. Uh, Ma, so Martha Dexen is her name. And they held, so in the metro station in uh, MG Road, so one of the most public places, we hired a room and we had photographs of residents in the slums talking about their perceptions of a sustainable city. Kannada and English, bilingual. And we brought the people, you know, the people whose photographs we had in the story we were sharing back. So all we were doing was removing ourselves and giving them that platform because they are invisible. And we had a footfall of 1,000 plus people over two days. It was a weekend. And these are the people, not people like us. We always feel we're preaching to the choir. But they came off the streets. They're off the metro. There was an open room with uh, paintings up, uh, photographs up. And they walked in. And there are people who told us, we walk past the slum every day for 30 years. We didn't know there were people here. We didn't know there was a man who weaves broomsticks from a coconut tree and palms. We didn't know there are people that fish here. We didn't know there are dhobis here that eat a livelihood. And now we will think of the city very differently. And when, you, when we brought the people there, media covered, them speaking to the city with their own voices standing next to their photographs. I think efforts like this, and it was too small and too piecemeal. I, I really wonder, I mean, but I think ideas like this, if we link across cities and can come up with ideas like this, where it's not just research about people, but people can inform our research and maybe people can inform the city. I think those are the kinds of things we need to look at. And uh, on your ecologically smart cities, I, I mean, I really like the idea of or non-smart cities. I really I think sometimes we should think of wise cities rather than smart cities. And there, there is ecological wisdom which comes from uh, people who are embedded in the land, which is often from low-income communities. Right? I don't. I think we have become so distanced from the land, we have lost that ecological wisdom, which uh, many others have. Uh, then uh, Simi, uh, again, I think very interesting connections between climate change and cities. We really need to think of how to link city. Urbanization and climate change have such complex uh, correlations. You know, One of the things that we see in Indian cities is that ironically air pollution is preventing our cities from heating up because of the smog. And China saw this when it cleaned up the cities and pollution levels went down, uh, heat island effects went up substantially. So microclimate issues, air pollution, and um, climate change have a very complex kind of uh, behavior. And similarly, rural to urban migration, adaptation, and climate change. I think we are not thinking, for instance, of the fact that if entire coastal areas get flooded in the next 20, 30 years, which is likely, what are you going to do with all this citizenship and NRC and you know all of this? It, it opens up questions of when you have mass scale migrations like Europe is facing, India will face these in times to come. Are we even thinking of these? I don't think we're even at any level trying to sit and think about what will we do in these 20 to 30 years? Because climate change, I think we're clear now, is not 2100. But probably in 10 to 15 years, we'll start seeing big changes. We're seeing it within India already. We're going to see start, start seeing large changes reshaping South Asia. So I think, again, very... I take again from you the idea of multi, of um, interdisciplinarity because I think urban researchers, climate researchers need to be thinking a lot more. Can we think of climate change uh, in a you know speaking of the COP agenda of how cities can be involved in mitigation in a different way? And I think there is increasing research coming from around the world that at least ideas like solar, for instance, there's such a big push in India. Can we follow something similar to the German path where we do aggressive solar in our cities? We're not taking our grasslands and our ecologically vulnerable spaces and our farming spaces and trying to do large scale solar, but doing large scale solar in our cities on our rooftops. And uh, can we do things like, I think we need to think of alternate paths or maybe both paths together. And we've really not seen how our cities, not just in terms of cutting emissions, but can be, they be sources of uh, climate sinks in some sense rather than just reduce the sources of climate. And I think there is much that we can do in the Indian context on research on that front again, which is collaboration with technology. Then. And this is a different aspect of interdisciplinarity. Right? And um, yeah, with, uh, so I'll uh, end with uh, uh, Sobhya I think, uh, yeah, your questions are uh, very thought provoking. What, I, I'll, I'll end with your last question actually on positionality. I think what positions do we take are so I so shaped by who we are and what our backgrounds are. Uh, I myself can see through my evolution of uh, looking at uh, cities as part of my research from 2006 onwards, 
my positionality or my ex have been shaped by so many of the people that I have worked with and learned from. And I think absolutely all the people we have interviewed and interacted with have each time, I'd say, humbled me in many places and shown me that they think of things very differently. So I think the positionality of a planner, a government officer, a, somebody doing CSR, somebody doing uh, uh, social sciences research, somebody doing humanities research, somebody doing technology, all of this. And then of course the other, rich and poor, caste, women, men, you know, old, young, all of this really shapes the city. How do we then have negotiations around what the city, who belongs to the city? I mean, I think I'll go back to this idea of rights to the city. And whose city is it? We all will have different positions on what we want from the city. And then how do you make sure that you can, you cannot remove power, but at least can you equalize that a little bit and make sure that the voiceless are given some amount of voice. I mean, have we really ever looked at urban visioning plans by asking people who are migrants and what their visioning plans are of the city, for instance? We never do that. Or people in slums, what is that? Some of the people in slums, like, uh, I mean, we call them slums, like the Lal Dura in Delhi or some of Bangalore slums, they've been here for 200 plus years. In Delhi, of course, they're the original inhabitants properly of that area. We just call them slums. So why are we not asking them what their vision of the city is? And often we get very surprising answers when we ask them. And some like the urbanization, but some, um, and it's mixed, it's complex in its own way. And uh, we have not spent that time trying to integrate them into our vision plans. I'll end with that. I think the positionality and the interdisciplinarity is what I've taken away from all of these uh, comments. And that has been very fascinating. A very rich discussion and thank you all. Thank you. In fact, in fact, you have rightly pointed out like there are many avenues for the common people, especially the marginalized section of the people to, uh, to make their uh, vision public. For example, we have this provision of what committee uh, thanks to the 74th Constitutional Amendment Act. But unfortunately, uh, the, the implementation of the 74th Constitutional Amendment Act can at best be described as partial or, or rather incomplete. Okay, so, so there lies the problem. Like we have some of the official policies which facilitates people's participation in urban governance, urban issues, but unfortunately they are not being uh, thoroughly implemented and all these things. So uh, uh, with this thing, let me, uh, also we have a couple of questions so actually, you, uh, there are some questions in the chat box and also there are some questions in the Q&A. So you can uh, see them and directly answer to this question. But before that, uh, just uh, now I request uh, Dr. Arjun, uh, who is the director of Impact and Policy Research Institute to uh, make your comments and observations. So what do you, Arjun? Thank you, ma'am. You can really choose any question you want to answer. Not in, uh, really, yeah. And um, uh, let me first congratulate you. And uh, also because APU is also leading uh, research methodology, I have also benefited for it. And, but I really wanted to start from uh, ma'am, your uh, very uh, unique observation about the R&D, especially in India and how the global North or South that divide. And when we uh, come into India as a whole, then, you know, the, the production of knowledge or even dissemination, many articles also comes, which are there in, in you know, in, in journal or books, which cost 15,000. So access also remains such a big deal. Our government, Many universities have also done a lot of things, but here also at Imprey, we try to do that, make, make knowledge sort of public and also bring forth in, in many different forms. Uh, so when was that question, ma'am, how do you think what is being done in that regard that uh, India take that space and also product indigenous knowledge for our uh, localized uh, solution? Uh, that was one. Second um, point I really thought to ask that uh, every year as we see, there is uh, some sort of record in terms of tree plantation uh, during um, the monsoon by all the governments. So how do you see this phenomena? This has become a sort of norm from all the departments. Uh, every year, sometimes Karnataka also plant like 10 crores, 12 crores plant, and then nothing happens. And in our infrastructure projects also, our minister also uh, uh, for the highway and others, that has been taken up that we will uh, plant across all the uh, highways, uh, uh, 200 meters, 100 meters of that green zoning. Uh, but uh, some of the new infra projects do have that, but uh, sustain and how it is happening, that also remains the question. How do you see this macro phenomena uh, occurring every uh, annually? And uh, second uh, uh, was related to technology in NDMC, New Delhi Municipal Council, the Lutian zone. That is a smart city. And there 
uh, what uh, we have done is to tag all the all the trees uh, with GIS and everything. There is a smart tree tag also. So uh, because that part of the city really have uh, those sort of resources to do that. Uh, but when you just step out of that NDMC area and then you see pollution and everything coming in, then how do you see in terms of urban governance, we have also NG2, uh, National Green Tribunal, mm -hmm. and so many quasi-judicial, so many bodies. How do you see these things going on? Uh, again, on macroeconomic point of view only, we also had NUPF, National Urban Policy Framework draft. Uh, there also ecology and other things were, uh, I, I said, good covered, but not very much on the implementation part. And uh, related to that, uh, since this year also it will be, uh, a COP26 and India is also preparing BUR third report and uh, other than you know forest cover also we are improving so overall we are also showing that India is doing so great in terms of climate change and cities and other things I mean how do you see in terms of policy measures or step what should be taken by uh, our local governments or uh, then also what the state government should uh, should do in in that aspect or RWA or what kind of thinking in in practical points can be done, greening, zoning. Uh, what is your view? Bangalore really has a very good activism as ma'am you suggested also, but also in the implementation of uh, zoning or uh, multiple projects, how do you see these things coming? And uh, one last thing, because I'm also a housing researcher, I was uh, uh, just thinking to ask you because this question, whenever we talk about India or developing countries come, that how do you see this real state or economics and environment conundrum going on? What is uh, your view for the way forward for India. I'll stop here and ma'am, you can uh, uh, choose to have any question or uh, shall I read it? Or so, sir, would you like to uh, uh, raise a few of them just in a crux? Some of I the think key points. From... Uh, uh, I, think, I think the questions are already, uh, I think it's already visible to uh, ma'am. So if you want to answer some of them, you may choose an answer. Sure, I think I'll take the last one, which is this uh, anonymous attendee on the Q&A, which is, says mm -hmm. that there is a lot of literature on the relevance of urban green spaces to health and well-being, but this and the solutions don't make a direct reference to power, which is at the crux of why something gets implemented or not. Can you talk about some of the theoretical frameworks that can help in understanding power relations? I think the same theoretical, very important question, first of all, because yes, power is at the core of why something happens, especially in cities or does not happen. And uh, the best science, the best solutions, the best uh, sociological understanding cannot help unless we fix this imbalance of power. And we all know that anyway, Indian societies are deeply unequal, deeply hierarchical, and power relations are at the crux. But I think in cities are also some of the most unequal places. So unless we fix understanding power, what are the frameworks? I think the frameworks are the same that we used to look at power anywhere else. So um, environmental justice would be really at the core of any of this. Uh, what what causes the outcomes and as Professor Sujata was saying, it's the poor that face the brunt of most of these uh, changes and the decision making is by people, even well-meaning, it's for the poor, it's not the poor making decisions about their own life and uh, we will not understand their life, you know, we don't understand why they make the decisions by, that they do, so we cannot design a city for them, you cannot expect a designer to design a city for them. And so I think this to me is, is at the crux and I wish more interdisciplinary work looked at this. Unfortunately, ecology, like I said, interlates is mostly done in its silo and urban sociology and anthropology and the, the political science, that is the, the discipline that speak to power is in its own silo. And we really need much more of this integration. So I thought this was a very important question. Uh, the others, um, I think I already spoke about smart cities and uh, given the lack of timing, and uh, definitions of cities and urban, I think there are uh, a number of uh, definitions. So let me just see if I can take some of the other questions from the, uh, from the chat box itself. One of the questions was how can cutting edge technologies like GIS and remote sensing be in, uh, help to build good cities? Uh, I think there can be a lot there because as I was saying, the, the main challenge with cities is our lack of space and fragmentation of space becomes a big problem. For instance, there's been a group uh, working on Mumbai for a long time, uh, led by a number of architects and uh, looking at Mumbai on two feet. And if you can come up with the idea of um, looking at uh, you know, how uh, basically taking the nalas of Mumbai and uh, re regenerating them so you can clean them up and make them into linear stretches. 
So people can walk and cycle on them. They're sustainable modes of transport. They are brimming with life. They have fish, they have plants, they clean up the water. I think those are the kinds of uh, approaches and GIs and remote sensing can play a huge role in those kinds of uh, policies. Uh, yes, I think uh, that's given the time, that's, no, that's what yes, I Thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you in fact for uh, your response to almost, in detailed response to almost all the questions. I Means uh, some of the questions are really uh, interesting. Anyway, so before wrapping wrapping it up, before we are already running short of time and it's al almost over, uh, almost one one hour forty five minutes. So just before wrapping it up, uh, uh, let me again request Professor Sain and Dr. Mukherjee uh, for their some very quick comments. Yes. I, I have no other other than the fact that, you know, I have benefited enormously and thank you for having me here. I, I really, really think we should have, uh, you know, more dialogue together. We should have some kind of probably a loose forum where, you know, people who want, I mean, think similarly can contribute with their own expertise and actually develop a language like you were talking about transdisciplinarity and I really, really take that point. And I think we should learn to talk to each other and develop a kind of a common language. Many oftentimes we don't do that, particularly with the scientists and the social scientists. Uh, and But I do see, I have a lot of hope with respect to that because I, I, I see uh, work being done in the convergence areas. I think that should be taken further and I, I, I think that if nothing else, there'll be just larger number of people from different aspects, walks of life asking the same question. Even that itself would be a, uh, you know, big deal. So yeah, thank you very much for having and it was, Harini, it was absolutely fascinating to listen to you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sen. And then uh, it's over to Dr. Mukherjee. Yes, I think uh, I absolutely agree with Shucharita uh, Ma'am's point and uh, not only interdisciplinarity, but how to also, you know, transcend from interdisciplinarity to inter, inter uh, or transdisciplinary to, to trans sectoral exchange of uh, knowledge. And uh, like all of us are, I think, uh, looking forward to uh, now to forge and craft common a common language of conversation. And that is the need of the hour. And I think your books and your works and also uh, I, we were uh, blessed to have SEMA uh, last year, uh, I guess. So, and uh, we, I mean, it was a brilliant presentation on cities and canopies. So I think, yes, so um, we have uh, been benefited a lot today. And, uh, and, and I think in spite of this uh, pessimistic uh, ambience, uh, I think you have been able to kind of infiltrate a lot of hope and optimism. And we see and feel hope, resistance, and uh, resilience in, in the Anthropocene. So which uh, would be a legacy, I think, uh, left on us and give us fresh energy to again uh, work on um, urban nature or cityscapes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mukherjee. And it's a word to Dr. Simi if you have any quick comments to make. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much to everybody. And um, I, I will just raise one last point that I wanted to very uh, eagerly is that um, the whole idea of city pollution is, is not uh, a making of that particular city. As we see in the case of Delhi, it is actually intercity also sometimes. And there are many times when one particular region or state is at the receiving end. So what are the reasons for such transfer of pollution? So for example, uh, burning of uh, stubble burning, et cetera, from Punjab, Haryana, Rajasthan, Western Uttar Pradesh. So uh, it just depends. And, uh, and we need to really focus uh, on a very uh, plain, unbiased, neutral stand on how do we uh, involve all the stakeholders in a positive manner and then channelize our way through. Because we cannot just uh, remain watching and waiting for uh, October, November, every year that, okay, this is two months and everybody has to be shut inside their homes with air purifiers. And um, this is how things will go on. So this cannot go on if we have to move towards sustainable environment. So this was my uh, concluding comments. Thank you so much. I have also benefited enormously with the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Simeon. Uh, uh, it's over to Professor Harini if you want to make any comments and then I'll finally wrap it up. No, I think thank you. This is a rich discussion. I think there were many questions that I could not finally get to also. So, um, but I think we are running out of time. But I, so, I truly enjoyed this. There are some, some discussions which are one way talking to an audience and there are some that enrich you much more than I think anything else. And I, I will go back with my head buzzing with ideas. And I think this will really so, shape a lot of future work. So thank you, everyone. So thank you. Thank you. And just, just, just to uh, say a final words, like we need to better understand uh, the environmental context of our cities and and uh, we need to think of a very different uh, sort of epistemology uh, from the current approaches of the way we plan and manage our urban environment and uh, some of the uh, ecological perspectives that have been discussed today I hope uh, can help to build this new epistemology and and change our praxis, praxis. and uh, thank you once again to uh, Professor Hardinin and also all the uh, discussants and panelists, Professor Sain and Dr. Mukherjee, Dr. Simi Mehta, Mr. Unahale, uh, for being with us in this particular session. And we continue to hold this uh, particular city conversation series. And we hope all of your presentation in the future events as well. So thank you once again and good night. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harini, ma'am. Yes, thank you. Have a good evening.